Well, it's thoroughly Jewish Thursday, so we'll focus on Israel. Is Israel on the edge of war? We've got to talk about the school shooting as well. It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, welcome to our Thoroughly Jewish Thursday broadcast. Not only the question of Israel with potential war with Syria slash Iran, but also charges being brought potentially against Prime Minister Netanyahu of bribery and corruption. What's happening with that? We'll talk about that. We'll take your Jewish related calls as well. We'll talk about some relevant scriptures. Here's the number to call 866 34 Truth, 866 866- Three four eight seven eight eight four. Any Jewish related question of any kind, we'll take as many calls as we can. So that's Hebrew related. That can be related to modern Israel today. It can be related to Jewish tradition. It can be related to a Jewish objection to Jesus. You might be a Jewish listener and you don't believe Jesus Yeshua is the Messiah and you want to challenge me or have a question for me. Phone lines are open. But first, the school shooting that took place in Florida yesterday, we were focused on doing radio and uh, had guests on the second half hour of the broadcast yesterday, didn't even know about the shooting until I got home. So did radio, went uh, to the store, came home and the news was on and Nancy was filling me in on the details. So then of course focused on that and looked at that through the rest of the night And, you know, in terms of fatalities, this is more than Columbine. Remember how devastating that was and how shocking that was and how overwhelming that was and how grievous that was. But there were more fatalities yesterday. A woman posted on my Facebook page and said, this is before they released the number of fatalities. She said, this "This happened right next to me. She said, I was there. She said, it's right behind my house. She said, it's worse than it's being reported. And then someone else sent out a note just about uh, her, her kids and they lost Instagram friends and then friends of friends. You realize how connected kids are with social media now. And of course, kids were, were taking pictures on cell phones and you, you, the horror of what, what took place. I can't relate to it. You know, you try, but I've never had something like this happen in, in my own life where I was there or someone that I cared for directly was there. Yes, we lost, uh, Nancy lost her brother at the World Trade Center in 9-11. So, so we know on that level, the, the shock, a loved one die, goes to work one day and never comes home through a terrorist act. But it's so hard to relate what the parents went through, what the kids went through in a case like this. And I was just praying, reflecting and saying, okay, what, what do I say? What do I write? I actually did something on Twitter. I don't want to be cynical about this, but I thought, you know, if I can get people thinking about this theologically, and asking them to pray, I can get more people praying. Because generally speaking, when we say, hey, pray, yeah, I mean, we know that gets limited response. But what I wanted to say was, listen, what's your own belief? Do you believe that God ordained whatever happened, God ordained? Is that your view? Or or is it a matter of people just choose its free will? Or is it Satan's activity? What, what is it primarily? And I, I put a poll on Twitter asking the question, but saying, and as you're answering, pray, because I wanted to draw more people into pray. And I, I was praying, okay, Lord, do I, do I write anything about this? Is there something I'm supposed to say in the midst of it? You know, what can we do about the pain and suffering? Uh, I know if there's going to be gun control debate and then debate about greater security in schools. And someone posted on my Facebook page, look, I remember going to school in the 50s. Uh, Kids would bring their rifles to school. The boys would bring their rifles and go out hunting afterwards. And then there was a marksman team with with ROTC, and and they they had everything locked up in one part of the school with all their guns, and we didn't have any trouble with it. And so I I just didn't feel I was supposed to get into that discussion, gun control, security, et cetera. Uh, But as I looked at it, I, I wanted to see before Columbine and after Columbine, what's happened with gun violence. 
And, and that was devastating to me. I went to Wikipedia and there was a comprehensive article about, about shootings in our schools. In the 1800s, there was, there was actually a violent act. That this was one of Native Americans attacking a, a colonial school or, uh, yeah, I think it was 1764, so it would have been a colonial school and kids uh, were, were killed in, in that, in that uh, violent attack then and then in the 1800s, et cetera, and, and 1900s, and then in the 2000s and 2010s. And what's clear, although there were some discrepancies in some of the figures, I mean, everything was documented, but some of the math didn't add up. And then the question is, what's called a gun shooting? Some said that there were 18 shootings in schools this year, and that would be in a, a suicide attempt would be included in that. And others said, no, that could just be a gun going off. There were, there were eight shootings total. When you break it down, when you break it down, there's an exponential increase in gun violence. I wrote an article about it. You can read it by going to askdrbrown.org, askdrbrown.org, and it's posted on other websites as well. But, but according to the article, there were 28 school shootings in America in the 19th century, so the 1800s. There were 226 in the 20th century and 223 already in the 21st century. We're not even a fifth of the way through. At this pace, we will go way beyond Combined shootings total in the 1900s in America will go way beyond that in the first 20 years of this century. And, and then look at this, of the 223 school shootings so far this century, 60 occurred from 2000 to 2009 and 153 or 145, depending on where you put numbers, say we're in the 140s or 150s in uh 2010 to 2018. You're talking about an exponential increase. And then the vast majority of those killed are kids in, in school. Uh, it, it's, it's intensely devastating. You say, okay, Mike, what are you saying to us? I'm saying that while we discuss all the relevant issues, while we discuss issues of who can get guns, how is it that this kid who was kicked out of school for disciplinary problems and of whom the students talked regularly and said, if, if someone's going to shoot up the school, it's going to be this kid. The moment they heard gunshots, they said, it's got to be him. How is it that he was able to have guns? That's a question. Was there security on campus? What about gun presence on campus to present this? These are all discussions that are going to be had. And then mental illness questions, wherever that comes in, or the kid's upbringing or Whatever else, the violent entertainment, the taking God out of our schools, the, the culture of death because of abortion, these are all discussions that we will have and should have. It, it doesn't ease the pain and the agony of the families right now. It, it doesn't bring back the lives of those that were, were killed. It doesn't heal the injured right now, all of our talk. But, but here's, here's my contention. When we say prayers and condolences with you. Our thoughts and prayers are with you. I have no issue with it, except I don't think we really do anything. That's my issue. This type of violence, this type of carnage in our school, in our schools with our kids, this should drive us to desperate prayer for our nation. This should drive us to prayer and fasting and crying out for mercy. I am all for saying we're praying, but let's pray as if America depended on it, because it does. It does. America is hanging right now by a threat of God's mercy and needs divine intervention in a radical level if we are not to destroy ourselves in so, so many ways. It's, it's that simple, friends. It's that simple. And that's what I'm urging. That's the purpose of my article, to call us to deeper prayer. 866-34-TRUTH. Let us go to the phones, and we will start in New Brunswick, Quebec. Reese, welcome to the line of fire. <laughs> Sorry, I think I made a little mistake with the call screen. It should be New Brunswick, Canada. But... All right, New Brunswick. All right, we're good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, here good. in America, we don't know. We don't know the problem there, so just keep going. We don't, we don't know uh, the geography so well. No worries, no worries. Yeah, so I was just wondering about the um, 
<clears throat> I'm just reading through the uh, Old Testament again in uh, in French this time, and it's always a struggle for me for, to get through um, the, I guess, drier parts of the Old Testament. Uh, for example, the the uh, um, elaborate uh, description of the tabernacle, or uh, you know, very long genealogies. And I'm just yeah. wondering how you, you know, as the uh, scripture is a uh, you know, God breathes. I'm just wondering how you personally work through those uh, drier parts. Yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned those because my first time trying to read through the whole Bible, I was doing great mm-hmm. until I, I hit my first genealogy in Genesis <laughs> 5 and then the Table of Nations in Genesis 10. And then, you know, kept kept reading through. I don't know if it's, you know, second restart, whatever. And then I got to the instructions for the building of the tabernacle and Exodus 25 to 31, I thought, oh, man, it's got to 32. Okay, the account gets exciting again and a lot going on. And then mm-hmm. you get to 35, and now it's they built it, you know, with all the details. Right. And, right so and what, I've, what I've done is this. And then you have the opening, what, six, seven chapters of Leviticus focusing mainly on, on sacrifices. By the time you make it to First Chronicles, the first five, six chapters are almost all genealogies with just an occasional mm-hmm. little verse with – with further teaching or explanation. So a a few things I do. One is I read through those passages more quickly. In other words, I I don't try to focus on every word, every name, every, every, every little physical aspect of how something's built, especially my mind doesn't work well with conceptualizing what the thing would look like. In other words, I'm not an, an architect or graphic artist that, that conceptualizes these kinds of things. Well, so I will read through, those passages more quickly. That's one thing. Secondly, I will pray, Lord, give me insight. Lord, I don't understand the significance of this. I don't, I don't see why we have so much detail. Give me insight. All right. And, and I, I pray that as I'm reading, I read those passage passages more quickly. Then I, I also, if, if I'm reading those things and it's a dry time, I will then read through those a little more quickly, but then read something else elsewhere in scripture that I'm going to find more nourishing or nurturing. So let's say you're reading, you know, four or five chapters of the Bible a day, and you just read through instructions of the building of the tabernacle or the first five chapters of first Chronicles. And you think, you know, I, I don't feel as nurtured. Well, go ahead and read something else that will nurture you and strengthen you during that time. And then what I've also found is many times when I go back and study something again, a major insight emerges. So stay right there. I want to tell you what happened when I taught on the tabernacle in the summer of 1984. We'll take your other call. Stay right there. You don't need a PhD to know that our world is in serious trouble. All it takes is one glance at your social media feed to see that we're at a critical time, not just in our nation's history, but in world history. And this generation of believers is facing an unprecedented barrage of attacks against the truth of the gospel. And they're coming from a thousand different directions. If ever there was a time for the body to speak out, to to raise a righteous standard and, and to be a beacon of hope in the midst of a sea of despair, now is that time. Through preaching and teaching and radio and writing and social media, God's given us a voice. I mean, by His grace, many, many lives have been impacted for the gospel around the world. So it's for that reason, I wanna take you behind the scenes here and ask Dr. Brown, let you know about some of the exciting projects we're involved in and share with you how you can help us fulfill this great mandate from the Lord in this battle for the hearts and minds of a whole generation. Over the last several months, our studio has undergone a massive overhaul. We have put thousands of dollars into revamping what is basically our command central. This studio is not just used to produce the Line of Fire radio broadcast, but we also produce in this studio hundreds of YouTube videos that you see, as well as our, our media for other ministry outlets like God TV and NRB TV. So this studio is really the heartbeat of, of everything, all the media that we produce at Ask Director Brown. And now we are ready to step into a whole new realm and we can do it with your help. So I'm asking you today to partner with us through your generous donations. We can fulfill this mandate from the Lord in this battle for the hearts and minds of a whole generation. And you can help amplify my voice. Friends, stand with us today. Together, we're making a difference.
It's The Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks for joining us on this Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. Michael Brown, your Thoroughly Jewish host, talking about our Thoroughly Jewish Messiah, Jesus Yeshua, who is also the Savior of the whole world. And I want to talk to you more about that in a moment. Any Jewish-related calls, phone lines are open, 866-348-7884. Uh, so, Reese, just one more moment I wanted to get back to. I remember reading through Leviticus many years ago and finding it very dry. And then I, I spent some time praying and fasting. I read through Hebrews and then I went back to Leviticus and it opened up for me in, in amazing ways. In the summer of 1984, I was asked to teach a class on the tabernacle. And I thought, I don't really want to do that, but I was asked to do it. And, uh, I, I got these overheads. We didn't have PowerPoint slides in those days, but these overheads you put on a projector and with images of, of what different things look like. And, you know, here's the altar looked like, and here's the priestly garments. And as I taught about them, I opened up the, the, the Hebrew for this meant this. And, and then here's what we can learn about the garments of the high priest. And anyway, we had an incredibly rich time. We, we were actually visited by the Lord. We had an outpouring of holiness and repentance and conviction of sin and turning to the Lord in the student body. Uh, it, it, was a, it was a wonderful season of about three weeks of an intense moving of God in our midst that came while I was teaching on the tabernacle. And I believe there's something to it. So as, as you're reading, rather than trying to figure out every detail, See if there's a message that emerges, maybe about the holiness of God or about the God being particular in how we worship him or other things like that. As I've meditated on some of these, I've realized, okay, and, and studied other commentaries. See, so when it comes to the tabernacle, uh, that, that you had the, the holiest of all, the holy of holies, the, the items that are made of gold. And then when you step out one step from there, made of silver, and then out in the court where others could come and offer sacrifices, that altar was, was bronze. So, so you, you have clean, and, and then you have holy, then you have most holy. And, and then outside the camp, you had that which was unclean. And, and then within the animals within Israel, there were some that you could offer in sacrifice that were therefore holy and acceptable. And then that which was clean that you could eat, and then that which was unclean and and so on and so forth and in other words it, it was show me how through the whole system of god's dealing with israel he was teaching them things and there there was clarity about the holy approach to god and, and then principles of atonement and things like that so sometimes if we don't get so caught up on the micro level then we can get some of these larger macro truths and and then you know going through leviticus i remember reading about the the qualifications of priests and, you know, if, if, you're, if you're a dwarf or if you had crushed testicles or if you had some kind of blemish, you couldn't serve as a priest. And you think that that's just unfair. But God was saying to Israel, there is a certain standard in approaching him. It, it was a physical lesson to convey a spiritual point. And with the genealogies, one other thing that emerged for me was how important each individual life was. And that you could be listed for good or bad. You worked on the wall in Nehemiah's day. You know, you get your name in there. That, that meant a lot. Or you could have your name listed that generations read. It's negative. And, and then the importance of the father to the son, the, the passing on of things from one generation to another. So certain larger truths emerged. And, and you know, rather than trying to decipher the meaning of every name, and is there a secret message there, which there, there isn't, by the way. So those are some things that I think are helpful. In that light, let me mention that the genealogy in Genesis 5, people have said, look, if you'll read it, it preaches the gospel. But no, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. No, no, no. The Hebrew names, if you look at them, I've looked at them. And in order to make it preach the gospel, you have to read meanings into some of the names that do not agree with the Hebrew meaning of the name. Sorry, but there is not a hidden gospel message in the names in Genesis 5. 866-34-TRUTH. Uh, let us go to Charlie in Johnstown, Colorado. Welcome to the Line of Fire. 
Hi, Dr. Brown. How are you doing? Good. Are you speaking directly into the phone, sir? Oh, no. I'm sorry. Is that is that better? Uh, yeah. We don't want you on speakerphone. We need you talking right into the phone. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, my question for you is I'm um, reading through uh, Job. And in Job 1-5, uh, when he's talking about giving an offering for his kids, he uses the word in case they curse God. Mm -hmm. And I was looking, and the word in Hebrew is the same word for bless. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering uh, how that makes sense. Yeah, so that is throughout Job 1 and 2, when Satan is saying that he'll curse God, you know, God will curse you to your face. So that uh, occurs repeatedly. Uh, and, and then at the end of the the second chapter, when he says, or the end of the first chapter, may the name of the Lord be praised, uh, it, it comes from the same root. So uh, it's simply a euphemism that it was considered to be too direct to write the words curse God. So it's just a euphemism. It's, it's using the word for the opposite of what it means. And anyone reading it would understand it. So if you had no clue, uh, you think, what in the world? Perhaps my children bless God or Satan or the adversary challenging the Lord, right? That, that he'll bless you to your face. No, so it's just a euphemism. I'm glad you looked it up in Hebrew. But it uses the word bless as a euphemism for curse because it's considered uh, too, too much of an affront to say those words, curse God, in, in that literature. That doesn't mean that it's not said in other places, but you do have euphemisms used. It's not the only time. Uh, we use euphemisms as, as well and, uh, you know, in, in different contexts, and we're, we're just used to them. We don't even realize we're, we're doing it. But in, in that case, you do have other euphemi euphemisms at time in the Hebrew Bible, and it was considered to be just too, uh, too, too much of an insult or an affront to God to say those words directly. So that's, that's why. All right. Well, thank you very much. You are very welcome. 866-34-TRUTH. Let's go to Seattle, Washington. James, welcome to the line of fire. Hi. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for having me on your radio station. And thank you so much for having this show. I, I get so encouraged um, and be able to be blessed by you. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Uh, I just had a question about the... Uh, Lubavitch, I think it's Shabbat. Chabad, Lubavitch. Chabad. Yeah, there's no ch Chabad. sound in Hebrew. Yeah, Chabad. Uh huh. And then they they kind of um, they are very open and very. Yeah, I'm, are you speaking? I, I'm I'm losing you there for a second, James. Uh, oh, yeah. Is this better? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So they have like you know events and community events, and that's great. I, I I'm all for that. But I looked into their beliefs, and they kind of believe that their Rebbe is the Messiah. And I just wanted to know what would be a, a great way to, like, reach out to them and, and you know, share the gospel. Because I feel like, you know, they have understand a great understanding. But um, I'm just confused how, how they can believe that. Yeah. So, but so they reject. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in short, just so others understand who we're talking about. These are Hasidic Jews, so they're ultra-Orthodox Jews, and they, uh, they have in common with other Hasidic Jews looking to their Rebbe or their Grand Rabbi uh, as, as their charismatic leader and teacher and someone specially close to God. What happened was the seventh in their particular dynasty of, of Hasidic leaders, their particular brand, which is called Lubavitch from, from a, a city uh, Russian city from whence they came, and then Chabad, which stands for Chachma, Bina, and Da'at, so uh, wisdom, knowledge, and, and excuse me, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, so Chabad is an acronym for that, uh, they, they became very unique among Hasidic Jews that under the seventh and last Rebbe, Menachem Mendel Schneerson, who died in 1994 at the age of 92, they became involved in Jewish outreach. They, they start Jewish schools. They work all around the world. They went into the former Soviet Union when there was very little Jewish education and, and turned many, many Jews to, to religious Judaism. And because of this great massive move they had and some of their mystical beliefs, they began to say that, that their Rebbe was the Messiah. And when he got very sick at the end of his life and had strokes and couldn't even talk, they said that he's going to reveal himself as Messiah. And then, of course, he died. And, and then many said, well, no, he only, it's a test. He didn't really die. He's spiritually still with us. 
And if you go to their headquarters, 770 Eastern Parkway in Brooklyn, where I was earlier this year, you can actually see a banner across the synagogue where it's a prayer to him, you know, long live King Messiah. And you can see his picture uh, and it says, we, you know, we, we welcome you, King Messiah. You can go into Israel and see posters of him. Now, the movement as a whole has continued and, and actually grown a lot since his death. People thought it would fall apart after that. It's grown substantially. And outwardly, the vast majority of them say, no, no, he, he was the potential Messiah. He could have been the Messiah if we were worthy, but we weren't worthy. So he wasn't really the Messiah. But others really believe that he was. And, and they, they will argue that, well, when the Messiah comes, it's going to be him. So they're, they're not, the leaders that you're going to talk to are very knowledgeable and, and have, have heard your arguments coming long before you got there. Nonetheless, you can really pray for the Holy Spirit to work in their lives. That's number one. Get my book, The Real Kosher Jesus. The Real Kosher Jesus. That'll give you some redemptive analogies. That'll give you some touch points that you could share with them. And then say, look, you, you thought your, your Rebbe could be the Messiah. You may think he still is. But our Messiah literally rose from the dead. And the Messiah had to come before the second temple was destroyed. These are some of the arguments that we raised that you could bring to these people who are very zealous and, and very serious about outreach. Uh, you could bring these things to them and you can say, hey, would you consider this? So my book, The Real Kosher Jesus, you'll find really helpful. Also, if you'll search for my video in search of the real Messiah, we contrast Menachem Schneerson with Jesus Yeshua. This is Ann Graham Lotz with Daily Light for Daily Living. Have you ever heard it said there's no such thing as an atheist, that no real atheist exists, that everybody really knows there's a God? Well, I don't agree with that. And my wife, Nancy, who was an atheist when we met at 19 and a hardcore atheist that that had been ever since she was maybe eight years old, she absolutely takes offense in that statement. Now, if you mean scientifically that it's impossible to prove the non-existence of God and therefore you cannot scientifically demonstrate that. Okay, that's another subject. But are there people who sincerely and genuinely in the heart of hearts do not believe that there is a God, that there's anything beyond the material realm? Certainly. Do some of them hate the God? They deny. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, in the Ten Commandments, God speaks about the idols. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. So, yes, there are some people who hate God. They see who he is. They see what he stands for. They believe he's real, and they hate him. There are others that deny his existence but act as if they hate him. You know, the summary of many of the new atheist books, the Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens books, the, the best summary of some of them is, there is no God and I hate him. So there are some people who hate what this God stands for or hate what they believe this God has done in the name of religion or hate the God of the Old Testament, but they deny his existence. So that's an interesting thing. But, but there are other atheists that simply intellectually or experientially don't believe there's a God. And they don't go around hostile and angry towards him all the time. That's a fact. And there are others, and I want to appeal to this, who I believe have a very high and lofty view of God and think that if this God existed, who was so good, who was so perfect, who was so powerful, he couldn't possibly allow the suffering and pain in this world. He would have to intervene more than he has. So I believe for some atheists, their rejection of God is because of a pain in their heart, not so much an anger, but they prayed and didn't find an answer, that they once believed the Bible, but it seemed in their critical, deepest, darkest moment that this God let them down, or they just hurt so much for a hurting human race, they can't understand how an omnipotent, loving being with all wisdom and all foreknowledge could let this happen, let a world be like this. So, I believe there's much to appeal to in those people and to say the God you dream about is actually real beyond your wildest dreams. You just don't have the capacity to fully understand him. 
I want to introduce you to that God. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. You know, hearing that music, Shouts of Joy and Victory, it reminds me of, of the famous chapter, Kohelet, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. It's Kohelet in Hebrew, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. That there's a time to mourn and there's, there's a time to dance. And, and right now, there are people celebrating. God's done something amazing in their lives. Just had a child. Just got married. Something spectacular and wonderful happened in their lives. And then there are others mourning, like those mourning the devastating losses in Parkland, Florida yesterday, or around the globe. Every moment there's rejoicing and there's mourning. And, and think of the heart of God. Can you ever consider this? The intensity of the heart of God as he cares for the human race and, and, and he sees and relates to the pain and the joy of the human race. And, and he sees the evil going on and because he has allowed us to make choices, does not intervene in the midst of it to stop it at certain times. Other times I believe he holds things back in his wisdom and holds things back in answer to prayer. But this much I know, everything we need is found in him, friends. Everything we need is found in him. It is Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. Here's the number to call, 866-34-TRUTH. Any Jewish related question of any kind, 866-348-7884. A few years back, we did a TV series called Think It Through. It aired for two years on the INSP network, and now it airs internationally on the INI network. And it's also airing on METV, Middle East TV, for Jewish outreach with Hebrew captions. And we did one broadcast called In Search of the Real Messiah. You can uh, see it if you go to my Real Messiah website. So go to AskDrBrown.org and just click on Jewish. And then you'll see various videos there. It's one that we did where we talked about these religious Jews based in Brooklyn, but working around the world who believed that their grand rabbi, the Rebbe, was the Messiah or could be the Messiah. And some said he is the Messiah even after he died. We contrasted that with Jesus, Yeshua. I think you'll find it to be very helpful and eye-opening. And I think it's just in search of Messiah. I don't think it's just real Messiah, in search of Messiah. But you'll find that among the Think It Through videos there on our Jewish Outreach website. And again, if you did not read the article that I wrote about the exponential increase in school shootings in recent years, and the call for serious prayer, not just saying, well, we're praying or our prayers are with you, but, but serious prayer, heartbreaking, heartrending prayer and crying out to God for mercy on our land. Friend, we're going to continue to slide downwards. All right. I want to turn my focus now to Israel. Again, any Jewish related call. So it could be Hebrew question. It could be a question about Israel today. It could be a question about Messianic prophecy. It could be a question about theology concerning the Jewish people. 866-34-TRUTH. That's the number to call. All right. A report from my friends Eddie and Jackie Santoro in England, in England, in Israel. Uh, uh, their their uh, email is called Zion's Glory Update. They're dear friends that have been living and ministering in Israel for many, many years now. And they, they give an update to give background on what's happening now with Israel and Iran slash Syria. And they said this to condense a very long and complex history. It's enough to say that Iran, the dominant power in the Islamic Middle East, has been helping Syria with arms and troops in its protracted civil war to drive out the radical ISIS rebels that have been trying to take control. Having succeeded in this, Iran has now instructed Syria to establish military bases close to the northern border of Israel. If you go to Israel, friends, if you join us on our tour, remember next February, February 1st through 10th, would just be the third time ever that we'll lead a tour to Israel. So it, when you go to Israel and you see the Golan Heights, this used to be Syrian possession. This is part of what, what Israel took 
in, in the first major war it engaged in. And uh, otherwise, uh, once it was established as a nation, but, but otherwise, Israel, for, if you were right there, you could, you could just be, you'd be standing there in your property just shooting Israelis. I mean, that, that's where the Golan Heights actually is. So, so Israel annexed that in the midst of war. But in, in point of fact, uh, Syria is so close, and then Lebanon even closer in, in other parts. So, so the threat to Israel is, is intense and constant. Hezbollah in, in Lebanon. So they explain that uh, Iran has instructed Syria to establish military bases close to the northern border of Israel. The purpose of these bases is to launch an attack on Israel in the near future. Obviously, Israel sees this as provocation and will not accept this new and dangerous situation. Several days ago, a large Iranian drone supplied by Russia flew over the border into Israel. These drones are large unmanned aircraft, usually man, used mainly for intelligence gathering, but they are also capable of carrying large weapons. Israel had been tracking the drone and shot it down moments after it entered Israeli airspace. Israel considered this an act of aggression, and in response, the Israeli Air Force carried out very large and effective attacks, destroying or damaging 12 military installations that were near the border. As they were attacking their targets, the Israeli planes were met with massive anti-aircraft fire. As the planes were returning, one Israeli F-16 was hit. The plane crashed in Israeli territory, and both pilots ejected and lived. Reports that it was a miracle that the plane went down on a piece of open land, not causing any damage. This incident was a great shock as it was the first time since 1982 that an Israeli plane had been downed by Islamic forces. So, friends, this is going on in Israel right now. In response to this, Israel retaliated with another round of strikes targeting Syrian air defense systems. For the second time that day, the Israeli planes came under intense anti-aircraft fire, but this time all returned safely. Israel does not want a war on its northern front, but the situation is very volatile with complex dynamics operating. Syria and Iran see the F-16 as destruction as incredible victory and are emboldened by their new ability to confront Israeli defenses. And according to a report in the Israeli left-leaning newspaper Haaretz, a telephone call stopped imminent Israeli-Iranian war. According to this report, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin stopped an imminent Israeli-Iranian war with a telephone call following recent es escalation. So I, I've not been able to look into that in more detail in terms of how widely verified and accepted this is. But according to Haaretz, uh, they described the call between Putin and Prime Minister Netanyahu as decisive and fateful as it immediately stopped the escalation. Uh, this much I know, there were reports of, of Israel could be on the edge of war, and, and then things just seemed to stop. This seemed to stop. So if, in fact, this is what happened, thank God for the intervention. 866-34-TRUTH. That is the number to call. And we will start in Fort Worth, Texas. Ian, welcome back to the Line of Fire. Hey, uh, I have a quick question. Um, so my father is Jewish. Uh, mm -hmm. His mother and father are Jewish. He's fully Jewish. My mom is Irish. So uh, in our family, and I, you know, I've heard it before that you know if your mom's not Jewish, and you're not Jewish. But when I read in the Bible, you know, it's you always see the the genealogies from the father to the son, the father to the son. So it would seem biblically that I would be Jewish, and then that traditionally. Uh, amongst a lot of Jews, I'm not. So I've taken some flack for that. So I was wondering, what what is it? <laughs> yeah, and let me just ask you this. When you were raised, how were you raised? What were you told? What was your consciousness? Uh, my dad's a Messianic Jew, and, mm -hmm. and my mom's a Christian. So, but we, you know, we still, a lot of the rest of my family, they're not religious in any way, but they would still, you know, practice. Right. Uh they they went to temple and then they went. You but know, what, what they, was your own what, your understanding when you were raised? Were you told you were Jewish? Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, for my father, um, but you know, and some for my grandma, but you know, the rest was kind of like, well, we don't really see it that way because you know, your mom's not. Got it. Got it. Okay. Of course, if you lived in Nazi Germany, the Nazis would have considered you Jewish. You would have been considered right. half Jewish, even if it was just from one grandparent, a quarter Jewish. You, you could have been considered Jewish. But yes, you can make a good argument biblically that the 
the uh, the understanding of this child standing went back to the father. So, for example, Solomon married foreign wives, but you don't you don't and he sinned in doing that, but you don't get any teaching there. Well, then the children wouldn't have been legitimately his as Israelite children, or they would have been looked at differently. The rabbis would say, yeah, but the book of Nehemiah, when when the Israelites intermarried, the Judeans intermarried with the Canaanites and others, when they divorced them, uh, they put they, they sent away the mothers and the children. That shows the children were considered Jewish. You could say, no, it's just because the mothers stayed with the children. You didn't have a single dad, you know, raising the kids. You had the mom raising the kids if, if that was the, the case. So um, my view is this, and this is very common in the Messianic movement. If either your mother or father are Jewish and you were raised with a consciousness of being Jewish, then you should see yourself as Jewish. And by the way, if you are Reformed Jew, so liberal Jew, they would, they would be at home with that thinking as well, either mother or father. It seems that in New Testament times, the, the idea of patrilineal versus matrilineal was not fixed. In other words, you're Jewish if your father's Jewish, you're Jewish if your mother's Jewish. And, and Acts 16 seems to point in that direction, that Timothy's mother was Jewish, father was Gentile. Timothy goes at head and gets circumcised. Paul has him circumcised to remove any doubt because it, it was obviously not clear at that point if you were considered Jewish, if it came through your mother. There was seemed to be debate at that time. So my view would be to, to say, yes, your father's Jewish. That is legitimate, uh, le legitimate genealogy there. That is legitimate uh, passing on of Jewishness from one generation to another or through the mother. And in particular, if you had this consciousness of, of being Jewish, then, then you should accept that. And of course, the biggest thing is being in Jesus, being in Yeshua. That's the biggest thing, right? Which you know and we agree with. But yeah, I would absolutely say, yeah, so I differ with a traditional Jew. That's what I tell them. Yeah, I differ with you. My father's Jewish. I consider myself Jewish. I believe God sees me as Jewish and I'm a Jewish follower of Jesus Yeshua. Hey, thank you, sir, for calling. By the way, um, the police say they have enough evidence to bring charges of bribery and corruption against Prime Minister Netanyahu. Now, it doesn't mean an attorney general will accept that or actually indict him and then trial what a verdict would be. It could be a big mess, but according to Caroline Glick, highly respected commentator there in Israel, she said this is no different than the, the investigation against Trump. In other words, it's just a hit job to drag him down. Let the truth come to light. Where there's corruption on either side, let it come to light. We'll be right back. I want to present to you a unique way that you can partner together with me to reach Jewish people with the good news of Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah. Hey, Paul wrote that the gospel is to the Jew first, but many of us don't know how to reach the Jewish people with the gospel. Can I tell you, we have a unique open door and Jewish people are ready to hear, but we need your help. When I was in Israel recently, my last hour in Jerusalem, about a dozen different people came up to me and they wanted to thank me for the impact of our message. One Jewish woman came up to me, a believer in Jesus. She said, you saved my son's life. He was falling away. He was getting pulled by other objections to Jesus. He read your material. He's back in the faith. A young man came up to me. He said he and his Orthodox Jewish friends, here he is, I mean, with the, with the yarmulke, the head covering, the traditional Jewish outfit, he said he and his Jewish friends, his Orthodox friends, watch my debates with rabbis. A few years ago, I was able to lead a Holocaust survivor to faith in Jesus. He was a brilliant man, an atheist who had fled the Holocaust. He read my books on answering Jewish objections to Jesus, came to faith, led his wife to the Lord before they left this world. Friends, we have the resources. We have books ready to be translated in Hebrew to be distributed in Israel. We have our Real Messiah website, unique for reaching Jewish people, Orthodox Jews with the gospel, ready to be translated in Hebrew, ready to do internet campaigns to get into every home in Israel. Every cell phone in Israel can have this message, but we need your help. Every gift to our ministry will literally help us reach another Jewish person with the good news of Jesus the Messiah. Go to askdrbrown.org. AskDrBrown.org, and when you go there, we will partner together to bring salvation to Israel and the Jewish people. Together, we're making a great difference.
Now is the time to reach the lost sheep of the House of Israel, to share in this end-time harvest of Jewish souls, and to find out how to receive this two-DVD set, Predestination, Election, and the Will of God Debate. Go to AskDrBrown.org and click the TV banner. Is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks. Welcome to our Thoroughly Jewish Thursday broadcast. Man, time is flying here. All right, I've got a challenge for everybody watching on YouTube. I'm looking at my big YouTube chat screen here. Send me some Jewish love. Yeah, some Jewish emojis, some, some Jewish love. Send it my way. Our little challenge there for folks on, on YouTube. And, and then everyone that's watching on our Facebook feed, you say, watching, this is radio. Yeah, but we have a live video feed as well on the Ask Dr. Brown YouTube channel and Ask Dr. Brown Facebook page. Send me some Jewish emoji love over there on Facebook and YouTube. Let's, let's see some, some interaction there. All right, <clears throat> that's, that's just fun. I give thumbs up. I get thumbs up sent back to me. Hey, one, one thing, if you could just stand with us. Uh, we, uh, we went to Appalachian State. There we, there we go. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, we went to App State University, Appalachian State University, uh, on Tuesday and spoke there about God's love for the LGBT community. It was, it was a great event. We've got the video on our Ask Dr. Brown Facebook page. But because of the controversy, uh, pressure came on the student group that sponsored it, Ratio Christie. God bless them for doing what they did. Sponsors dropped out. Finances dropped out, which then affects us directly in terms of us working together with it. We said, hey, we're doing, we're, we're coming to, to do this anyway. But if you appreciated what we did on the campus there and, and want to stand with us and help, would you would you just send a designated gift? Go to askdrbrown.org, askdrbrown.org. Click on donate, all right? And, and you, you can designate or just send it in. That would help because there was a financial shortfall in the event. And this is just a way to get, we said, hey, we're doing it anyway. It doesn't matter. But it'd be great if you could stand with us. 866-34-TRUTH is the number to call. And let's go to Nathan in Raleigh, North Carolina. Welcome to the Line of Fire. Hey, Dr. Brown, can you hear me? Hey, yeah. Okay, um, I, I'd like to say it's an honor to speak with you. And uh, I watched your live stream at the college and I thought it was very um, informative and you touched people's hearts. And uh, I just like to thank you for that. And uh, I think it was very, very good for the college. Well, thank and thanks for watching. I appreciate that. Yeah, and uh, my question was, uh, I wanted, I'm reading uh, under my Bible app, the Chronological Bible Plan. Yeah. And I'm in, I'm in Joshua right now. And I wanted to know, uh, since a lot of that is going through the genealogies of the families and where the land went to each family, is there any genealogies back from that time still, you know, going through and living today from the Bible? Okay, to, to my knowledge... Absolutely not. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of it in any, any verifiable, reliable way. However, I saw a, a video of an ultra-Orthodox Jew in Jerusalem, and he was saying, oh, no, go to my house. He said, of course. I forget how the question came up. And he said, I've got to go from my father to his father, his father, all the way back to, and however far back he claimed. I don't know if he claimed to go back to Abraham. Of course, that's pretty out, even more outlandish. But, but he made that claim. So I'm not, I'm not oh, saying wow. the man's a liar, but from everything I know, no, no such records exist. However, there are those who can trace themselves back to, to Aaron and the priestly family through DNA and genetics. That, that if, if you'll get online and search for uh, Aaron or genetic code or priestly DNA, You'll, you'll find that. And so in that way, not genealogically, but genetically, I do believe that there are some that can be traced all the way back somewhat definitively to Aaron and his descendants. I'm not, I'm not a geneticist, but from what I understand, it seems to be reliable in certain cases. You say, well, can you prove that it's Aaron there? Well, you have this whole tradition of people having certain names you know, like, like Levi, which is, is Levi in, in the Bible, tribe of Levi, or 
uh, Cohen, which is Cohen priest, and, and you trace it back for centuries and centuries, and then you, you ultimately trace those groups back to, to one person or one clan in Israel, think, okay, that, that seems to, to be, in other words, we don't have Aaron's DNA, but you can trace it back in, in that way. 866-34-TRUTH. Uh, let's go to Baya in London, England. Welcome to the line of fire. Hello. Hello, you're on the air. Hello. Go ahead. Oh, hello, Dr. Brown. Thank you so much for letting me um, uh, come through on there. Yeah, my question is, um, I just wanted to uh, understand, you know, the scripture where it talks about Jesus turning water into wine? Of course. And uh, uh, I'm trying to understand the culture that, that is happening there because, you know, some say that it is alcoholic wine, some say it's non-alcoholic, but there seems to be something about what they're saying there. They're saying that, uh, you know, in the in the culture, they seem to bring in good wine, and then after they bring in the poor wine, some say it's bad wine. So I think I'm just trying to get an understanding of the culture to understand if it is alcoholic or yeah. non-alcoholic. So if, if it's non-alcoholic, then everyone is going along with the joke, you know, ha, ha, ha turned it into grape juice. And yeah, this is the best wine. You saved it for the last. So uh, no, from everything I understand, number one, wine was alcoholic and the potential effects of wine are found in Proverbs. You know, that wine's not for kings, for example, or Proverbs chapter 20, okay. verse one, that says wine is, is a mocker. At the same time, wine was just part of the normal culture. It was not as fermented as wine today. And, uh, I, I was in California recently with my assistant Dylan and, and there was a Jewish guy that was visiting and an Italian family that was hosting us for dinner and they offered us wine. And I said, no, thanks. I uh, uh, wasn't going to drink any, uh, any, anyway, uh, my assistant noticed that the kids were drinking wine with dinner. I said, yeah, in some cultures you, you have it like instead of water and, and you never get drunk your whole life. So the Jewish culture of the day Wine could be readily drunk, celebrations, things like that. And yes, normally as you're drinking a little bit more wine, you get a little bit more relaxed and so on. And so you don't have to bring out as good wine the next round. You know, in other words, it's not a Jewish cultural thing. It's just common sense, you know, because the people are, are a little bit more relaxed and free, etc. But there's no evidence that they were drinking to drunkenness or that that would be typical. So drunkenness was always considered wrong, but to celebrate with wine was certainly part of the culture. So I, I can make a very strong case, sir, for drunkenness being sin and why we need to guard against it. I personally have abstained from liquor since I came to faith for a number of reasons, but I cannot make a case that everyone should abstain from any drinking as long as they drink in moderation and their drinking doesn't cause others to stumble. Those would be big issues in scripture. Drunkenness, always wrong. But to the best of my knowledge, it was real wine, just not as fermented as today. And the goal was not to get people drunk, but to just add into their wedding celebration. Hey, thank you, sir, for asking. 866-34-TRUTH. Uh, let us go to Rock Hill South. All right, we won't go there. Let's go to uh, Ogden, Utah. Darren, you're on the line of fire. Hi, thanks for taking my call. You're um, welcome. I was just wondering, uh, what are the requirements uh, to become a rabbi? You mean um, today? I've been, yes. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Um, I was reading, uh, it was probably the same passage as the previous caller where Christ turns the wine or the water into wine. Yeah. And some people have said, I guess, that uh, that would be the responsibility of the the groom, which, you know, in this case. Right. Yeah. How would that uh, tie in with the woman, rabbi question, though? Um, is being married a uh, part of uh, the requirement to be a rabbi? Oh, okay. Got it. So. At that time, New Testament times, there was no such formal title as rabbi, all right? This comes in after the destruction of the temple. So, so about 40 years after the time of Jesus, sometime after that, rabbi at that time was an honorific title. So, so my teacher, my master, 
that could be given to a, a gifted teacher or a charismatic leader. So when Yeshua, Jesus, is called rabbi, when John the Immerser is called rabbi, that's an honorific title. There was not formal ordination. Uh, as, as history unfolds, now there are specific requirements to be a rabbi. No, you do not need to be married to be a rabbi. Uh, many, many folks I know were ordained as rabbis before they were married. But marriage is expected and important. In Judaism, you're considered to be not complete if you're not married. So it's a rare Jewish leader that is not married in traditional Judaism. But no, marriage is not required. And just like you can go, say, if you're going to be ordained to the Presbyterian church, you have to go to seminary, get a certain degree. Uh, to be ordained as rabbi in ultra-Orthodox circles, you have to complete a, a massive amount of study of traditional literature and be deemed proficient in that. To get ordained as rabbi in the more liberal circles, you go to one of their seminaries, you complete your degree, and you get ordained there by certain studies. It's much less rigorous than your traditional Jew. Hey, let me say this, this last thing. Thank you, sir, for asking. Uh, let me say this last thing. Sometimes we're told, well, you know, Jesus is okay for the Gentiles, just not for the Jews. No, no, no. If he's not the Messiah of the Jews, if he's not the one who fulfilled what's written in Moses and the prophets, if he didn't die for the sins of Israel and the world and rise from the dead, he's not the Messiah of anybody. The reason he's the Savior of the world is because he's the Messiah of Israel. It's not the Messiah of Israel. It's not the Savior of anyone. It's both and, not either or. Talk to you tomorrow.